Welcome back to Scripps News Tonight. A law passed by the House and Senate in California will add gender affirmation as a factor to consider in custody battles. The bill, pending the governor's uh, signature, it would make whether a parent affirms their child's gender a matter for the judge to consider in the cases. Some existing factors already include the health and welfare of a child, history of abuse, what the child-parent relationship looks like, and drug and alcohol abuse by parents as well. But critics have alleged the law will take away children from parents who either deny or just question their child's gender identity or oppose them getting medical procedures, um, medicines or surgeries. Ex-CEO Elon Musk himself, the father of an estranged trans daughter, voiced a common criticism. He alleged parents will lose custody and describing medical care for trans youth as, quote, sterilizing your child. A note here. The long-term effects of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones are still unclear. Some studies finding fertility is affected in some patients, but not in others. Also, the bill asks judges to consider all of the factors we listed, not just gender. The bill would not require a judge to side with a parent affirming their child's gender, and it does not block non-affirming parents from having custody or visitation. Still, this is a notable change affecting an already thorny process of custody. So let's bring in Chris Melcher tonight. Works in family law. He's a California divorce attorney. He's handled several high-profile cases, including those involving celebrities. Chris, would a judge, in your experience, feel comfortable taking a child away from a parent if, let's say, for instance, they had reservations about their middle school child suddenly announcing, I'm a boy, I'm not a girl? Well, Chance, this is this is the issue here is how would a judge interpret this law uh, that's already been passed by the California legislature, but is yet to be signed by Governor Newsom. So he has until October 14th to decide. But if this is passed, it sends a very strong message to courts that they not only need to consider it, but they really, really need to take this into consideration strongly when determining which parent is going to get primary custody. And the other one's going to really be getting visitation and much less contact with a child. Now, courts already have vast amount of discretion and have to look at a wide range of factors, like you noted. And we leave that to the court's discretion or good judgment. And these are highly specific factual circumstances that these families find themselves into. There's no, you know, kind of one size fits all approach for these families. And of course, if a child has, um, gender diversity or tr transsexual or intersex, that um, if that's going on, that's obviously one of the factors. And, and the court should correctly consider um, how that's affecting the child, how that's a, how each parent is supporting or not supporting the child. So uh -huh. sure, that should be considered. But the concern is, is that now we're telling the court that this is some kind of super factor that could result in a child being taken away from a parent who even questions that decision. Let me ask you how they would consider it, because families do have a right to privacy. Parents have rights. The state cannot come in and say, you have to raise your child vegetarian because that's actually better for them. And that's the responsible thing to do as a parent. You know, that's the right thing to do as a parent. Is the state becoming too intrusive here? Well, it's the problem is, is that when parents can't agree on custody, a court has to decide. And, and, and this is a very scary thing, you know, for any of us who, who are parents to go through the thought that a judge has a decision to tell us when we can see our child. But that's literally what's at stake in a custody dispute in every case where some, you know, the parents can't agree and they have to surrender that to a judge. Now, certainly all these issues are at play and they should be considered. The problem, though, is, is that you know, asking a court to put special attention on something. And the way that this bill is written is saying that the court has to consider whether a parent affirmed it. And so the implication is, is that if a parent questioned legitimately, you know, what's going on with this child and what do they need and how do we best support this child? If, if you would legitimately question those things that a parent could potentially be punished mm -hmm. by having their, their relationship reduced with that child. So that's where I think that the concern is coming from. Um, not, you know, not to say that the court shouldn't consider it, but it's kind of like, what message are we telling courts when we enact a law like this? Well, Chris, what about religious liberty? Because, I mean, setting aside any cases, which, you know, maybe a minority of someone who's just being mean or ugly to the child, someone who's a conservative Christian or conservative Muslim or other faith, and they just don't endorse gender transitions, 
do they not have religious rights in the way they would raise a child? Well, sure, Chance, you're raising a great point because there is a fundamental right, a constitutional right that we have as parents to raise our children. Now, of course, if the family's breaking up and the court has to allocate custody time uh, between parents, then the best interest of that child prevails over pretty much everything else because we want to protect children. We want to make sure that they're safe and happy. And so the court has this broad best interest standard that we're considering. What the author of the bill is saying is, is that children who um, are transsexual or um, you know, intersex or gender diverse have been shown to have greater mental health problems or at risk of suicide. I'm not saying that. That's directly from the author of the bill. And the author is saying that if a parent does not support that child, that that child is at risk of suicide. And so despite what the author is saying is that this is essentially a neutral factor, hey, Judge, it's one of the things you need to consider when you read the what the author's statement is, is basically saying if you don't support this child's decision um, or sexuality or gender, that you are now placing their health and safety at risk. And, um, and again, that may be true in some cases, and there may be extreme cases where a parent has just been absolutely cruel to a child, and that absolutely needs to be considered. But also, we as parents are expected to question things and talk about things and find solutions, and we should not have our parental rights taken away just by asking questions and wondering what's going on and what the best solution is for our child. Which I've been reading a ton of coverage, and, and you do hear everyone say, we do not want any child to die. But you do hear a lot of parents' rights advocates say, you know, if a parent wants to prioritize getting mental health diagnoses or treatments before, you know, moving on to this, because, again, a lot of people who are going through this as young people, they do have concurrent, um, you know, mental health challenges, um, you know, is that grounds for making them not live with the parent? That's the struggle. If this were to go to the Supreme Court, what do you think they would say about that? Well, you know, you, you raise a good point about the, the fundamental right of parents to make decisions. And, and honestly, you know, I, I think that the, the Supreme Court um, would would also look at the best interest of the child and how difficult and thorny these areas are. My concern, though, really, is that we don't always know what the child really thinks or wants. This is being reported to the court by the other parent. So we, we rarely put a child on the stand and saying, hey, what, you know, what are you going through? What do you want? We don't want to put the child on the stand. So most of these cases, we have one parent saying this is the gender identity or expression of a child. And this other parent is awful because they're not supporting it. And there is now, if this bill is passed, an incentive to manufacture a dispute like that so that um, you know we're now left with one parent's word against another, and we really don't need, don't know what this mm -hmm. child needs, or whether one parent is really not supporting them sufficiently to have their rights taken away. Any custody battle, as we said, is thorny. Um, you know, this has been quite contentious to hear the bill's author speak about her own home's experience and her own child, and saying, "I'm doing this for, you know, the best interest uh, of these children who can't speak for themselves." Um, again, some challenges may be on the way here. Chris Melcher, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, a Kentucky.